Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you very much for being with us today. My name is Scott Miller, and I am on faculty at the Darden School of Business, as well as a research fellow and director of the Project on Democracy and Capitalism here at the Miller Center. And I am very thrilled uh, to moderate today's panel as we look at the economic and financial implications on the war in Ukraine. So as all of you know, uh, slightly more than two months ago, Russia launched launched an offensive uh, against Ukraine, um, an unprovoked attack on its southwestern neighbor. Uh, and almost immediately thereafter, and to many commentators' surprise, the West quickly implemented, implemented a vast program of economic and financial sanctions against Russia. The West's remarkable exertion of financial and economic power, combined with the tangible effects of a full-scale war in Europe, has the potential to shift many uh, of the paradigms in which the post-Cold War world has functioned and operated over the past several decades. So today, I want us to take a step back and look at the crisis through a broader set of geographic and temporal lenses. Uh, and in so doing, explore several big picture questions. The first is how might the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the West reaction to it uh, change the global economic and financial paradigm? Uh, number two, does the invasion threaten global economic and financial stability? And then three, how will the invasion uh, affect the Russian economy in the medium and the long term? And the thing about this is taking the step back is not particularly easy. Uh, the constant stream of, of military and humanitarian and even economic and financial news tends to, and for good reason, focus our attention on the micro events that comprise the day-to-day -day story of this crisis. Um, and I'm very interested in that day-to-day. -day. However, as a historian, um, I believe it's important to examine not just what the global financial and economic uh, system will look like over the next day, or over the next week, or even the next year, but possibly even what it will look like in five years, 10 years, and dare I say 25 or even 50 years. Essentially, uh, what will the historians look back on and see is important. Um, so put, put a little bit more simply and succinct, for the next hour, I want to have a step back and try to see the economic and financial forest um, even though the trees are uh, interesting and indeed important. Um, but before I begin, I would like to introduce our all-star panel uh, for today's discussion. Uh, first, we have Bob Bruner, who is a Miller Center, Miller Center faculty fellow, university professor at the University of Virginia, distinguished professor of business administration and dean emeritus of the Darden School. Uh, he has held numerous visiting appointments at Columbia University, INSEAD in France, and IESE in Spain. He is the co-author, author, or editor of more than 20 books on finance, management, teaching, and financial crises, particularly apropos, I think. Um, he has been on the Darden faculty since 1982 and the winner of numerous awards for teaching, both at the University of Virginia and across the Commonwealth uh, in which we live. Um, welcome, Bob. Nice to be here. Uh, also, we have with us Yurgos Alianis, who is the Robert F. Bruner Distinguished Professor of Business Administration and former Associate Dean for Darden's Global uh, Executive MBA program. He is an expert in corporate finance, risk management, financial institutions, and international finance, and his work uh, has examined the impact of derivatives on risk uh, corporate governance and operational hedging strategies. Uh, he also works on, again, apropos to today's discussion, volatility and financial crises. Um, his work has been published in all of the leading journals of his field, including the Journal of Finance, uh, Journal of Financial Economics, and the Review of Financial Studies. Uh, welcome, Yurgos. Thank you, Scott. Uh, also, we have joining us Elena Rubakova, uh, she directs the Institute of International Finance's Economic Research on Emerging Markets. She was previously a visiting fellow at Bruegel, um, where she focused on financial markets, emerging markets, and central banks. 
She has held senior, senior level roles in economic research at a diverse set of institutions, including Deutsche Bank in London, as well as leadership positions at a Monday uh, Asset Management, Avantium uh, Investment Management, and Citigroup. She has also taught at the Stockholm School of Economics, as well as lectured at the London School of Economics, the New Economics School in Moscow, uh, and Chicago Booth in London. And just for the record, if you are looking for someone to follow on Twitter uh, to find out what is going with the sanctions regime, Alina is the one to follow. So it's a pleasure to have her with us today. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be on such a distinguished panel. <laughs> Absolutely. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Ian Solomon with us today, who is the Dean of the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. Uh, trained as a lawyer, Ian is a devoted student and teacher of both negotiation and conflict, conflict resolution. Dean Solomon served uh, in the U.S. Senate as a legislative counsel to someone you may have heard of by the name of then Senator Barack Obama. And then later in the Obama administration, he was the US executive director to the World Bank Group, uh, where he championed private sector development in Africa and negotiated a range of multi-stakeholder agreements. So welcome, Ian. Thank you, Scott, great to be here. Perfect. Well, before our audience at home, uh, before we get started, please note that we'd love to incorporate your questions in today's discussion. So please put those into the chat. Um, and those will get filtered into us and we will bring them into the conversation um, as we are able. And then last but not least, um, we want to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the democracy, the project on democracy and capital. And we'd like to acknowledge uh, the generous gifts from Verizon, uh, Virginia National Bank, the Marcus Praxis Fund, the Hewlett Foundation, and then three other private donors who not only make this event possible, um, but the entire project. So we are incredibly grateful to them. So all that uh, aside, let's get going into the conversation. So I'd like to start with Alina. We're gonna look at the forest, but to begin, I think looking at the trees a little bit would be helpful. So Alina, if you could just give us a, a, a quick summary of, of the sanctions regime, what it was meant to do um, and how effective you think it is at the moment. So thank you so much. So the focus of the first round of sanctions was mostly on the financial sector, but de facto in some ways it also became a trade kind of embargo measures, You know, although that was not originally the intention. The intention was similar to what happened in 2014, but with much stronger force, remove Russia's ability to access global markets and also create financial sector instability in Russia. So what happened after 2014, Russia reacted and did actually a wonderful macroeconomic rebalancing strategy with the fiscal uh, rule, with inflation targeting introduction. But of course, they had to go overboard with that. So regular people didn't get the money. They put this money in the coffers for their, it turns out, future geopolitical, very scary objectives. Um, so that was the response of Fortress Russia strategy after 2014. So what happened this time around by freezing the reserves of the central bank, that directly undermined this Fortress Russia strategy. And I think, therefore, it was the most effective measure. So freezing, unprecedented freezing, I'm sure we'll discuss it more, the implications, historic implications of this, more than 30% of the central bank assets basically brought them back to where they were before the, the, the Fortress Russia strategy, and also left them with uh, financial assets that's very hard to use to intervene in the market. So to me, this is the most significant impact. Then indirectly, we also got some of the trade measures where either companies refuse to trade with Russia because it's very difficult, or for actually moral reasons, they refuse to trade the self-sanctioning. And I think that will also have an impact on the economy. Have the sanctions been effective? Yes, the first round of sanctions has been effective, but not as effective as many hoped for, for two reasons. One reason is Russia continues to enjoy large inflows through the balance of payments or foreign exchange inflows, oil and gas sales, that also go to the budget. They account about 30 to 50% of the budget revenues. The second reason is very skilled response of the Central Bank of Russia. The response that they provided now is better than any other central bank has done over the history of 30 years of recent crisis in Russia. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and this this question goes out to the, the broader group. Um, but uh, these these sanctions have really been a, a pretty significant uh, institution of of power. And so, uh, Yurgos or, or perhaps Bob, I was curious of how you see 
um, global financial markets more broadly, perhaps even beyond Russia, kind of reacting to this, this show of power? I'll offer one comment, which is, uh, I believe the Russian invasion of Ukraine marks a dramatic pivot in the global international financial system away from uh, integration, greater integration, which has been the thrust of the past uh, quarter century, and toward uh, uh, localization, deintegration. Uh, and in fact, the very phrase, as Alina uh, cited it, fortress Russia really suggested almost the strategy of autarky, of turning inward, of total self-sufficiency, which is unrealistic in today's world, but nonetheless um, is a dramatic pivot. And I think many, uh, shall we say, non-aligned countries today are watching very closely to see what is the impact on Russia of Russia's strategy. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I can add, uh, Scott, on what Bob and Alina said, uh, there's definitely, a, you know, if you if you listen to Larry Fink, uh, you know, the end of globalization. I don't know if that's where we're gonna end up, uh, or or if this is sort of a, um, a temporary or uh, you know episode uh but it's it's clear that there is some uh differentiation the allies the west uh, so far has been quite cohesive uh both in terms of the sanctions as well as in their support for ukraine uh and of course the question is uh you know will there be any um any you know divisions as as the war continues and i think that's that's an important issue in terms of uh you know how a russian crisis may impact the rest of the world it's kind of not as clear because uh you know as bob mentioned being separate uh, and kind of isolated uh perhaps it will have less of an impact um i would say the uh there's an interesting one interesting fact that it just happened this last weekend where my actually friday uh that russia paid uh, the u.s denominated debt um in the coupons in dollars uh, whereas in april 4 they had paid in rubles and that uh, you know caused uh, the rating agencies to suggest that well it's uh, uh yeah, that's technical default of, of the of the you know of the sovereign debt and uh, this is something that by the way uh, uh putin and others have tried so hard to avoid and uh i think they were trying to see whether their their bluff will will go but finally they ended up paying in on friday and uh it's in Citigroup london so they're not going to be technically in default i think uh, for a while so they use their own reserves that are at their disposal that are still in, uh, you know, in uh, in Russia, to uh, to pay that. So, I wonder if I might just uh, add on, um, just ask us to maybe shift our lens a little bit, just to the the magnitude of this moment we face right now. I mean, the the scope of humanitarian catastrophe that is the backdrop of the situation. You know, at least five million people having fled Ukraine. 7 million people within displaced, thousands dead or wounded. The Ukrainian economy estimates to have collapsed by 50%. You know, Russia in the midst of a, of a recession, I think Alina IIF has estimated 15% loss of GDP. I think that's a rough estimate. Um, you may have updated that in the past week. May, I don't know whether it's gotten better or worse, but just the, the magnitude of this coming at such a difficult time for the global economy generally um as we're still trying to dig ourselves out of the pandemic um slow down and of course dealing with an inflationary moment here so some of our policy tools even to respond are constrained as we go through this period so i think that to me it just elevates the the critical moment we face um as we as we pivot or we we, we navigate what fortress russia may looks like you know we're all so connected and we'll talk later about the impacts on food on fertilizer on oil but the spread of this there is no isolating this in, in, in russia or ukraine this is a global 
global crisis, and we can talk about how big or how small or how long it may last or what its long-term ramification will be, but there's no question, we are already there. Absolutely, and and this is this is one of those things, and I, I'd like to go to Alina, but then out, out to the group. Um, you mentioned that the, the Russian Central Bank has actually performed exceedingly well. Um, if you look in, in the days after or the weeks after, you see the ruble begin to collapse. Um, it's since clawed back the majority, if not all of those losses. Um, you start to see people lining up at ATM machines, but, but that kind of bank run dynamic seems to have ebbed. Um, Alina, if you could just lay out for us perhaps what the Russian Central Bank was able to do that kind of has prevented us from seeing this crisis? And uh, and then to the broader group, what might uh, you think might happen that could bring these crisis dynamics back into the picture? I think Russia did a lot of preparatory work after 2014. And I think the introduction of the new management of the central bank, implementation of inflation targeting, and clean up, clean up of the financial system, that was an, an important foundation of what the response that they provided immediately after the crisis. Um, so that, these are all the wonderful measures that could have been taken, hopefully, without, ideally, without any geopolitical adventures, that would have been, without any wars, that would have been much better, of course, for Russia and for everybody globally. In terms of the immediate response to the sanctions, um, I think more than doubling the interest rate immediately, then providing liquidity support to banks suffering runs and implementing capital controls. So these are the three measures that they did um, immediately without waiting. And I think that had a big impact. Uh, these were draconian capital controls, effectively freezing of foreign currency deposits, inability for individuals to convert money. And even though there was an allowance of $10,000 dollars until September, it was since eased a bit, you couldn't effectively get it. Your manager in a foreign, even in a foreign owned bank would just postpone the date and it was very hard to get to. It. So I think the speed of the response, the preparation that they did before, and this sort of doubling the rate, you know, capital controls and liquidity support to banks that need it. Yeah, uh, it, one of the questions then, Alina, uh, is, you know, are they the question would be, are they out of the woods or, or is these kind of temporary measures? There have been recent pieces in the Financial Times and elsewhere saying, you know, that that this is all a puppet show that really underneath the cert or on top of the surface, the Russian central bank is able to keep things relatively stable. But underneath uh, there's flailing and, and major problems. Uh, do you think that that's true? Um, and if so, uh, what might bring these problems back to the surface? So I think where the economy is undoubtedly having a lot of problems is complete separation of the value chains on the export side, on the import side. And I think Robert and colleagues here talked about it. Uh, you cannot build, uh, President Putin said that USSR lived under sanctions and achieved great success. If that's his definition of success, he can build that success. But you cannot really build genuine success while trying to go into complete autarky. And uh, we've seen a survey of more than 13,000 uh, Russian enterprises across all regions. And every single one of them is reporting that I have a problem. I have a problem, either I lost my export market or I lost components. And it's not only just high tech components, which are subject to export controls. These are little simple things that people are refusing to trade with you because you're toxic, you're politically toxic to trade with. And also because of difficulties with SWIFT and regulatory, you know, just companies don't want to mess with it. So if, um, you know, it made sense for you to import this little simple screw, uh, it doesn't make economic sense to produce it domestically in Russia. Well, well, or Turkey, you might have to. So I think that's where the pain point is now. And we will see where the choke points are for each and every industry. It's car manufacturing, processing. It's even agriculture. They rely on imported seeds to, to plant the new harvest. This year, they're fine. The next year or the year after, we're not sure. So this is on the economic pain. On the financial sector, I think for now, actually, they are very likely to hold. Of course, the financial sector will suffer from re lack of repayments, increase in NPLs. The government already is taking measures and will have to take more. I think without further sanctions, it's unlikely we'll see big disturbances in the financial sector. If anything, ruble is too strong. The central bank is worried if whether they can regulate the tap on the dam, you know, like if you just open the tap a bit and then it just blows into your face. So they've been trying to see how they can uh, loosen up capital controls a little bit to prevent the ruble from strengthening further. And of course, that's where the risk is. You know, we see a lot of um, 
um, sort of illicit, let's say, outflows from Russia. You know, we've seen it in the previous crisis. And I think even the central bank is worried that they cannot control friends and family that might want to exit en masse if they open up the taps a little bit. Absolutely. Yurgos and Bob, do you have a sense of, of what could really cause broad scale stability and bring that, that crisis element back to the Russian system? I would like to point out that the history of financial crises uh, shows that crises always begin in the periphery of the financial system, rarely in the center of the financial system. Uh, so there are undoubtedly some institutions uh, inside Russia and on the periphery of Russia, outside of Russia, but uh, that are feeling a great deal of pain right now and uh, could could break in unexpected ways. A case in point would be the episode with the London Metals Exchange in early March, where uh, the uh, Ching San, a, a major a producer of nickel, uh, took a large short position. And in the face of the Russian invasion, nickel prices rose. The short position became untenable, and Ching Shan um, would have faced enormous losses uh making good on its uh, short position um, as a consequence the london metals exchange shut down the exchange uh, canceled the trades and uh, uh, reduced ching san's exposure uh, to nil this uh, has caused an uproar in financial markets and commodities markets we can explain this away as uh, um, yet another episode of uh, government interventions, perhaps behind the scenes, aiming to uh, uh, save firms that are too big to fail. Uh, Tsing Chan would be might be an example of that, although it wasn't clear that Tsing Chan was truly going to fail as a result. It would have taken enormous losses, but. Uh, Behind the scenes, uh, the London Metals Exchange is owned by uh, investors in Hong Kong who, it was rumored, were pressured by Beijing. Uh, will Someday we may find the true uh, uh, trail of influence behind this rescue, but it certainly calmed the markets, but it has... Uh, you know, raised the the reminder to all of us that the instability in markets can begin in unexpected places. In fact, it usually begins in unexpected places outside of our our um, scrutiny, our monitoring, and uh, probably outside of uh, what might be regarded to be good regulatory prudential supervision. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we don't have the transparency inside Russia these days, given their their um, suspension of publication of uh, economic data and financial data. But uh, uh, it it seems unlikely that, given the intense supervision now within Russia over its financial sector that uh, we will see an outbreak there uh, but we're left to speculate where else trouble might begin but trouble can travel once it breaks out yeah just uh, to add to that trouble can travel i like that uh bob uh you know i think that the 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 interesting part about a crisis is the unknowns and uh kind of to echo what bob said and uh uh, also, kind of, we don't know what we don't know, and uh, you know, uh, I can I can talk about the, um, the our own financial crisis that you know we really didn't have much uh, you know much view until until it really happened. So, um, but at the same time, I would say you know just to um, to add to what Alina was saying is that. Uh, 
the, 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 the central bank has, has actually uh, responded quite effectively in terms of, at least for the moment, in terms of how uh, to avert a crisis. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when uh, when the war started, uh, Sberbank, which is the you know the largest bank in Russia, uh, and they were listed also in uh, in the London Stock Exchange, uh, their stock price crashed. I mean, it went from I don't know, I forget the, the price, but it was like ninety nine percent down. So imagine if the same had happened to uh, one of our the number one bank in in our country, and uh, you know that would be uh financial crisis uh big time and yet uh you know what happened well they stopped trading this uh, the russian stocks in in london uh they stopped immediately the uh the, the market trading in in moscow and uh, they opened it up some time later propping up the you know the the banks uh, and, uh, you know, in, in a way, life goes on. They, they, I would say one, one uh, interesting thing that we see now is, uh, so, 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 I mean, bottom line on this is that uh, even such an event that you would think that should have really shaken the markets, it, you know, and, and Russia, it, it actually didn't. So it was kind of surprising. Um, the second part is that, um, the ability of Russia to trade in ruble and to prop up the ruble. I mean, if you see the ruble, it was uh, 76 or so uh, to the dollar uh, before the, the the war started, and now it's about 67. So, so the ruble actually, after it went to 138, so it it was a huge depreciation, and then now a huge appreciation of the ruble. And uh, part of it is because. Uh, as we've seen, the latest tactics is they've really tried to force countries to pay in rubles, right, uh, and threaten to Bulgaria and Poland to cut their um, their gas and uh, 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 exports. And uh, and so, you know, and, and I was reading somewhere else that uh, they've also uh, forced exporters to change their foreign currency into rubles. So, so in, in, in a sense, um, and then what do they do with the rubles? Well, they can provide liquidity, they can do all kinds of things uh, domestically so that uh, things don't go out of control. But in, I'm just going to throw the last thing about, you know, and I know we're going to talk about spillovers later on, but just to, to get an understanding, um, the Moscow Stock Exchange is about, you know, the market capitalization is about 400 billion. That's as much as uh, Walmart. So it's it's not really anything, you know, so significant. So that's one part. And it's uh, the total market capitalization of the, the Russian stocks is less than 4% of the MSCI emerging market index. So that tells you a little bit about on the financial side, uh, you know, that's not really a huge component of, of the global economy. Um, and I think the, the most interesting and telling thing to me, I'm gonna say this is the last thing to say for now, is that uh, the fact that in the end, they decided to pay their coupon, the sovereign debt in dollars, which is not a lot. They don't have a lot of uh, dollar denominated uh, debt. Um, it says that actually they are you know, concerned about that and they are sort of gonna do anything to, uh, to, uh, avert, uh, to avert a default. Absolutely. I, I, I think this notion that that crisis travels and that while the, the main issue may be in Russia, our automatic assumption is that, well, look for the crisis in Russia, where in many respects it may go, uh, may pop up somewhere else if it does indeed pop up at all. Um, very quickly, I want to encourage the public, if you do have any questions, to please put them in the chat so that we can get them uh, to, to our panelists. Um, but what I want to do now is, is in that spirit of, of travel, so to speak, is, is go to Ian and talk about the potential spillover effects of this, because we've talked a, a lot about Russia and the Russian economy and financial system. Um, but there's a lot of other effects that have uh, come up elsewhere in the world. So, um, Ian, what are some of those spillovers that are particularly interesting or concerning to you at the moment? Yeah, thank you, Scott. And uh, it's been great to learn from my panelists here, so I, I appreciate this. 
as, as I look at financial crises, um, you know, a few observations. One is that the poor suffer most in a crisis, you know, the poor people and poor nations, and in part because they often were in crisis even before we realized there was a financial crisis and the levels of instability and vulnerability and, you know, uh, challenge were great to begin with. So poor suffer most in crisis that it very quickly spills over, not just to other sectors beyond the financial sector to the real economy, but across, across borders and across the world. Third, that finance drives politics or financial crisis drives political crises and political instability. And finally, that political instability shapes what type of recovery and the pace and speed and, and, and global nature of that recovery. If I just look at one issue, the issue of food. Obviously, you know, commodity prices have been driven up. Um, food, the level of food insecurity in many developing countries now is really quite elevated since before Russia's attack on Ukraine. Um, the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, their food price increase index, the food price index increased 12.6% between February and March to the highest level it's been at since the index started being tracked in 1990. And in several parts of Africa in particular, it's even more severe. In you know, Burkina Faso, Liberia, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Togo, prices for basic food staples have jumped 40% above their four-year average, of their five-year average. Um, you know, we see Nigeria, they get about 25% of their wheat from Russia and Ukraine. They're one of the fourth largest wheat importers in the world. Um, Cameroon, Tanzania, Uganda, Sudan, source more than 40% of their wheat imports from Russia and Ukraine. The World Food Program, which distributes food to those in, 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 in crisis situations, gets half of its wheat from Ukraine and have warned that the war lasts beyond April. Well, guess what? We're beyond April. Acute hunger may increase by 17% globally, meaning an additional 47 million people suffering acute hunger. Um, the largest concentration in, in East, West, and, and Southern Africa. You know, this is around food. We see this with energy and heating prices. We see this with access to healthcare. We see this on the refugee front. Um, so I'm quite worried about how, um, you know, the poor will suffer most and how this will spread. We see this, you know, and of course, it spills over as in migration issues lead to different political challenges. Um, I'm quite worried about countries that were, you know, imperfect democracies to begin with, teetering on the edge, are now going to face severe pressures internally. Um, what does that mean for our ability to, to, you know, bring a, a unified and global response on things like changing our energy dependence to kind of reduce the vulnerability and dependence on on Russian oil, for example, going forward? Um, so, you know, I take very seriously the concerns of a of a spreading crisis. Um, and our inability to respond effectively because we have this reduced policy space, we're all worried about inflation right now. So just at the time when central banks are raising interest rates and trying to slow things down, we might need to find ways to um, provide some stimulus in, in parts of the country and parts of the world that are struggling. Without, without if I might add on to that, Ian, without question, the humanitarian uh, threat overshadows uh, all others, and to that we could add the standard, the, the panoply of spillovers that occur in in uh, financial crises, such as waves of bankruptcies of small and medium-sized businesses, uh, rising unemployment, uh, declining tax revenues for state and local uh, uh, governmental bodies. Uh, potential debt defaults by all of these. And, and then the ugliest uh, economic phenomenon, of course, is a what's called a debt deflation cycle in which uh, borrowers, uh, debtors, uh, are, are forced to uh, repay their obligations in uh, rapidly depreciating uh, in, in, in currencies, but currencies based on uh, asset values that are rapidly declining. And so they, they throw assets onto the market in an effort to, to gain the cash to pay their debt obligations. 
throwing assets on the market just lowers the price of the assets further and the spiral continues until everybody's bankrupt or everybody's been repaid or uh or worse a, a political catastrophe uh to which you alluded i i think all of these are examples of how severe financial crises can get absolutely um one of the things that i get and and uh i do want to uh make a quick correction i apologize earlier when i said please put to the public please put your your questions in the chat it's actually the q a function uh so sorry looking at the zoom there but the q a function would be fantastic um one thing for uh for for perhaps your ghost or alina to to explain one of the things that as i've talked with friends uh and family who don't necessarily do this for a living um which may say a lot about me but nonetheless um is is well how does this kind of food crisis actually react and and proliferate into a broader systemic economic crisis you know i i don't think it's as uh uh, as obvious how these transmission mechanisms work. So could you give us a sense of how these incredible increases in food prices um, that Ian has described in addition to, to uh, just the basic instability and uncertainty would cause some broader systemic crises? Maybe I start quickly, and I think um, Ian described the food crisis very well, but I would also add the global commodity price increase. And so uh, they should we see oil prices and just today, uh, Borrell uh, mentioned that European Union is getting ready for oil measures on Russia and potentially an embargo. So we should see this more sort of decisive measures. We'll also have oil at 135, 140 for the rest of the year and for some time to come. That will likely have an impact on the global economy. We'll have recession risks in Europe. Um, if it goes further, we'll have a global recession risks. This is at the time when central banks might be forced to respond with hikes. And what makes emerging markets very different from developed markets is that their, that their risk premium price then in their local markets is much higher and also related to the foreign currency, uh, foreign currency flows. So emerging markets might be burdened with lack of access to commodities, with already sort of weakening global economy, their domestic economies, but at the same time, they might be forced to hike to prevent outflows from their local markets uh, or capital outflows from their markets. So I think that is a very uncomfortable position. Uh, this is at the when IMF and the World Bank might struggle to meet demand if many emerging markets and frontier economies come at the same time for support. Um, even without this dramatic scenario, a milder scenario that also you know, doesn't sound so mild that it was just descri describing, but relatively milder scenario, when we're just having this sort of food crisis uh, without the global recession. Um, for frontier economists, um, they're already struggling with the biggest questions, food, uh, food uh, access, food prices, and even energy subsidies. So where do they find fiscal space to be able to deal with these issues? Do they come to the IMF? Does the IMF has the right resources, the right programs to be able to support them? Um, this is still an open question. So we need to go back to this global um, sort of multinational institutions to fight crisis. Do they, are they still fit the purpose? Yeah, just, uh, I think I want to highlight what uh, Elena and Ian were saying, that there is definitely going to be a symmetry. So there's uh, some part of the world that is going to feel this a lot harder than the other part of the world uh, and uh, clearly uh, i was reading that actually uh, yeah, Le lebanon uh, imports 90 percent of their uh, wheat from you know russia and ukraine so so you can imagine uh, lebanon already being in the situation that they're in what that might uh, you know might uh, uh, cause and uh, you have uh, Egypt that you know we know bread is uh, throughout the Middle East is very very important and they put uh, you know controls to on the price of bread because remember the uh, uh, the Arab Spring in a way you know it was it was caused uh, or propelled by the increase in uh, in food in in bread so so we have to be careful uh, you know it's uh, it's one of the things that we don't know what might happen but unfortunately one thing we do know is that there's already uh food uh insecurity in many parts of the world and there's also food prices and commodity prices going up so that really doesn't speak well for what's coming 
Absolutely. I, I think we've addressed the question, but Michael Wesson asked, uh, like I, I said, we just mentioned this a little bit, but what financial impact in developing countries do you see um, from Ukraine's shutdown as the breadbasket of Europe? I think Yurgos just mentioned something that was very important. You know, in many Middle Eastern countries, uh, when the invasion began, you started to see a significant devaluing of their currencies. Egypt's currency lost 20% over a weekend, um, essentially anticipating that they would have to pay a lot of dollars for bringing in bread at a, or wheat or, or flour at a higher price. And, and that can be a, a significant problem, especially if you have if those countries have debt obligations that are denominated in dollars, all of a sudden those debt obligations get much more expensive. Um, one of the things uh, that kind of continues to come up again and again, um, and this comes from a question from BC Grigsby, um, can you please comment on the Russia to China relationship given Ukraine's role in the Belt and Road Initiative? or more broadly, how the Russia-China financial relationship might evolve going forward. So I'll throw that, that question, very, very big and important question out to the panel. Maybe I'll just start quickly and then uh, we can uh, go around. So I think China holds the key now to how successful Russia will be was their autarky. You know, they cannot go for full autarky and they understand that. So the only remaining partner that they have is, is China at the moment, India to a much smaller degree. China might be the key supplier of the second rate technology, which is at, the, at higher prices. And also China imports a lot of energy from Russia already. And it might decide that it wants to pick up more of the cheaper commodities that Russia is exporting. Of course, as the distinguished professors here in this group, you know, will explain better than I do. When you have a monopoly, it usually doesn't work out well for the consumer, right? So that's, uh, that's where we will be right now for Russia. The question is, and we saw in Yellen's speech setting the stage for the spring meetings at the Atlantic Council, uh, was the French shoring. And so it's sort of, I saw it as a dart in the direction of China and India that careful, if you go too far this way, we're going to we're gonna put secondary sanctions on you. Uh, and of course, China is much more integrated in the global economy, and particularly in the, with the US financial industry. Um, so it would be definitely much more painful. But um, clearly, the US Treasury is serious, and, and they're sending a strong message. And I think China heard that message. Union pay, without further comments, you know, withdrew from some of the uh, sort of common projects they were planning with Russian banks. Um, so we'll see how that uh, evolves. I would add uh, to Elena's uh, comment one thought, which is, uh, in addition to the demonstrated uh, financial strains and weakening within Russia and the military uh, underperformance, um, we could be seeing an evolving partnership between China and Russia in which Russia becomes the vassal, the, the, the subordinate to China in what is ultimately a, you know, a very close uh, um, Eurasian uh, alliance. And make no doubt about it, uh, uh, Alina used the word monopoly. Uh, <laughs> it, it could go hard on Russia to continue to take whatever terms China is willing to give. I think this is one of the really interesting questions is what, what role will China choose to play here and India as, as well in this context and, and how that and, and how vulnerable we may be to kind of a, a fracturing or a fragmentation of, of kind of a, a geopolitical order we've come to expect, which was largely integrated, as you said earlier, Bob, but that may now be disintegrating um, and with less confidence in, in a system that is integrated. Yeah, I, I won't predict the future. I can't do that. But but I do think that, that this will be one of the key things to watch is, is in the next couple of weeks, and you know, but then going longer term, how does China choose to navigate and play a role as world leader? As a, one, among world leaders, does it choose to step up and support a multilateral integrated system or allow it to, to fall apart? And so if I could build on Ian's point, I think the, the incentives toward global integration are huge. And they are they've built up over the past few decades, um, 
the abandoning global integration uh, will be very costly for many nations, especially those developing economies that uh, Ian and Elena have uh, described so well. Um, but uh, it feels like a tipping point. It feels like the Ukraine war could mark a, uh, a pivot in the history of uh, global integration. Uh, and yet I would also add that given the huge economic and humanitarian incentives in favor of uh, globalization, uh, we shouldn't write it off just yet. And I would second Ian's point, uh, we, we can't foresee the future. We, none of us has a, uh, a crystal ball in which to predict. Uh, we're all speculating here and our uh, members of the audience should bear that in mind as, as you take away uh, any comments here. But uh, I think integration, global integration is definitely the long-term topic to watch. Uh, just, oh, sorry, your ghost. No, please. just like one quick tidbit. Uh, what I learned from uh, my uh, China uh, expert colleagues that China cannot be happy right now. They have a lot to contend with, uh, with uh, zero COVID policy and all kinds of things, and sort of have to be pushed in this, uh, you know, situation where they, you know, on the one hand, they, they, you know, there's this alliance with Russia, but on the other hand, of course, there are the U.S. sanctions that uh, might bite and would could be uh, further, uh, you know, uh, impacting the, uh, the the economic growth that uh, that makes their situation very very tough, I think, and you know, make them really think about uh, the the whole issue with Taiwan as well. But that's for another another day. <laughs> Absolutely. Your, your goes, I, I, following up on that to you, um, and as we have about, you know, 12, 13 minutes left, there's a couple of questions I want to get to, but one that I also get from a lot of students um, is, is what does the use and uh, imposition of these sanctions have on future U.S. or, or Western, but largely U.S. economic power? Um, you know, the, one of the greatest quotes I ever heard, we were in a meeting and, and our colleague Alan Lynch said, you know, to use power is to lose it. The question is whether you can get it back again. Um, and so the question to you, Yorgos, and then to the rest of the panel is, um, do you think that this will be a kind of uh, a moment where Western economic power uh, starts to, 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 to peak uh, and people say, oh, we don't want to expose ourselves to this. We're going to start building other systems. Or is the Western economic power and financial power so vast um, that it's going to maintain its main role in the global economy? I think that uh, we're not going to lose the power for the medium term, at least. Uh, again, how much can you see in the very long future? But uh, uh, these systems have been built over over time. Uh, like the SWIFT, I'll give you an example. The SWIFT uh, system has about uh, uh, 11,000 uh, financial institutions connected around the world. Uh, China's system, the uh, uh, I think it's called the CIPS, C -I -P -S, uh, has only 1,100. And Russia also tried to have their own system, and I think it has 100 financial institutions. So if you really want to look, if you really want to trade with the world, if you want to do business, you have to go through a financial intermediary that will, will leave the discussion for of, of cryptocurrencies and uh, in, in some other in some other panel. But, um, you know, the financial institutions are still sort of uh, well, the cornerstone of international trade. And if, you know, if, if you cannot really connect the importers and the exporters uh, together, uh, that's, you know, that's very, Problematic, and that's why I think the SWIFT uh, sanctions have a, a very, very important bite to uh, to what's happening. Uh, barring, I, I would say, the oil and, and the oil embargo, the oil issue, which we, we can talk about it. But uh, just to answer your question, Scott, I don't think in the in the short term that, or even the medium term, that anybody is going to gravitate to more RMB or anybody is going to gravitate to an, another mm -hmm. currency. Uh, to to do business, yes, there's going to be more. Uh, Russia is going to is going to 
use more rubles and uh, it's going to demand more uh, ruble payments. Uh, but uh, these things have been built over so long that it's going to be it's going to be difficult to change. Uh, now, we don't know how this war is going to evolve. And uh, one interesting thing that uh, just to add here is um, uh, about about uh, autocracies. Uh, I was reading Ruchir Sharma's comments in Financial Times. He's from uh, Rockefeller International. That he has uh, uh, he has examined autocracies uh, over time, and basically he finds that they are very sticky. So they they the autocrats find way to disentangle the political and the economic uh, sides and sort of keep uh, keep ruling. So so that I think is a very interesting. Uh, Thing to take into account for what's going to happen in the future and so we don't know how long this is going to last and uh what potentially that might mean for also for for the american uh hegemony uh going forward absolutely um one of the the questions that uh hedges it, or goes right uh, on to, to something that your goes brought up so i think it's a perfect time to bring it up um, is a question uh, from Peter uh, Chapin that said, uh, if the EU cuts off Russian oil, how significant would the impact be on Russia? Um, kind of bringing this conversation back uh, full circle. Alina, first to you, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what the Russian Central Bank has done and, and kind of the status as of the moment, but um, if we do indeed see an embargo pop up here on Russian oil and or gas, what kind of impact would that have and how would it affect the broader system? Well, Russia relies on oil and, oil and petroleum products exports, almost half of their total exports. So, uh, and a big chunk of it, uh, I think about 60% goes to Europe. So that's, um, that will have a very dramatic impact on the, on the balance of payments. In addition to that, oil and gas revenues, but particularly oil revenues because of the particularities of that taxation in Russia, account for the federal budget about 30 to 50. And of course, 50 is when the rest of the revenues collapse, right, which we expect to have this year, um, of the total revenues for the budget. So oil has a direct impact on Russia's ability to finance their budget, the war. Um, so that definitely will have a dramatic effect. Of course, it will have an effect on economic output as well. Uh, the question is here, oil is fungible, right? Put petroleum products are even more fungible. So how can we prevent, you know, if we're doing targets for European Union, how we prevent Russia from redirecting most of their production towards other countries on one hand? And on the other hand, if we're too successful about preventing them, you know, how do we prevent from having a global spike in commodity prices that kills the rest of the global economy? So I think these are very difficult issues that the European particularly, and together with American and others um, you know, who are against the war, are struggling with what is the best way to design smart sanctions. And we have seen uh, proposals, you know, whether doing an escrow account, doing taxation, and also doing a monthly or sort of, sort of yearly targets for, to remove Russian oil, signaling strongly to President Putin that, look, if you continue, we'll keep on working at uh, diversification away from uh, Russian energy altogether. um kind of as with with about five minutes left one thing we've talked about is the possible fracturing of this liberal order right the, the post-world war ii liberal liberal interconnected what you might call at least what i would call kind of globalization 3.0 um and this is very easy to talk about in the abstract but difficult to kind of personify um, and bring down to the ground. So I was wondering um, if, if putting it to our panelists um, in, in all of your different areas of expertise, if we do, and of course we don't have uh, the crystal ball, but if we do start to see the siloization of the global economy, what does that look like on the ground? What kind of impact can that have on, on people, whether it be in credit markets, commodity markets, other types of, of global economic systems? Um, I'll, I'll offer the first point, which is it's got to be bad for global trade. And global trade accounts for a, um, a very substantial part of uh, uh, gross domestic product um, 
uh, for uh, any developed economy and uh, indeed most emerging economies. So it's it's uh, it's bad news. As I said earlier, I think there are very very strong incentives in favor of globalization and global trade, uh, which certainly over the medium, maybe over the longer term would would tend to eat away at the fracturing, uh, the, the, the regionalization of, uh, of trade, but, you know, other things can get in the way of that happening as well. Yeah, I think I'd add to that. Um, I, I don't suspect it happens all at once, right? It's little by little, little signals into, into the global economy, signals between countries about whether we still believe in global institutions and global agreements. And one could argue that for a period of time, it looked like we were weakening some of those bonds. And actually, the attack of Russia on Ukraine has strengthened at least many of those bonds in the West um, and a recommitment to some institutions and, and, and a reinforcement of some agreements. So the question is, how will this play out if we do see this fracturing um, with regard to, to China and, and, and what role India decides to play here? Um, so, you know, what I would hope we would see is a continued recommitment by countries to institutions globally, whether it's relating to, to you know, within the UN system and, and, and uh, you know, related to climate change, the World Bank, the IMF, um, the World Trade Organization, signals that show we still want to hold these institutions as convening places where we can try to work through this, but it's not going to be sudden, it's not going to be direct. Um, but hopefully we can maintain a, a, the global dialogue long enough, because it's always been, I think, a few steps away from collapse, and yet we've managed over time to, to keep it going. Uh, Yurgos, uh, how, how do you think that this, that a, a potential decoupling could, uh, could affect uh, global credit markets? Is, is this something that we should be concerned about? Well, maybe more expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably the first outcome, right? So there's going to be a premium to uh, to raise funds in different places. Uh, I mean, already we see. Uh, I think the biggest thing is uh, of this is already we've had the inflation coming, and maybe there is even more through the energy market and through the uh, the food cycle. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, I think we should mention as, as prices go up on oil and gas, for example, that really helps Russia. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're making more money. And so in, in a way, uh, if, if, if the oil price goes up 30%, they can lose 30% of their, you know, yeah, roughly uh, of their output uh, to, you know, if they can't find somebody to buy it, but, and still be on the same, on the same front, so so I don't know. This is, but I think to me that's a very key thing. Is what's going to happen with oil and gas? I mean, I, I agree completely with you on this. That um, we don't know um, whether they find other markets, and we don't know what's going to happen to the to the oil price. We, I, I think we, we suspect that it's going to go up, and I think that's feeds the you know the the budget that feeds the war. Absolutely, and and Alina, la last question as we kind of. Uh, come towards home here. Uh, if if you were to to recommend to our viewers, you know, what's the the, the next thing that you're really looking for to kind of show us where uh, the, what's going on in in this Russian Ukraine economic uh, and financial uh, narrative? If we say, what should our viewers be looking out for that they may not necessarily already? Well, I think. For our viewers and the particular students and researchers, I think the, the economic statecraft is, is, is a revived field. You know, if you look at economic sovereignty concepts and statecraft, it sort of looked to be old up until 2014 and more recently. So we are discussing here economics and finance, but what we'll really be watching is negotiations on the geopolitical, on the foreign policy and the military front. So what happens on the ground in terms of the military um, actually finds itself in our discussion on the sanctions. So sanctions, uh, as uh, even President Putin said, that it's akin to an act of war, or it's uh, the, there's a fantastic book, Sanctions Are um, War by Other Means. 
So I think that's what we'll be watching. And then end of the day, we'll be watching what's happening on the ground in terms of the conflict, uh, whether the war can be stopped sooner. And that means how much further sanctions we expect uh, to see and how much further pain for Russian economy, but also spillovers or spillbacks to the global economy we'll see as well. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Yurgos, Bob, Ian, and Alina for, for joining us today and for just having a wonderful conversation. I'd like to thank all of our viewers uh, on behalf of the Miller Center and the Project on Democracy and Capitalism uh, for joining us today. Um, please stay tuned to the Miller Center website. Uh, we are continuing to put out content on this conflict uh, on the ongoing blog, and there will also be uh, commentary and, and events uh, forthcoming on that as well. So for all of us, thank you so much, and we will see you soon.